Hey folks, so we've got a lot to do to get ready uh, for our school pet, the bearded dragon, that's gonna be coming really soon. And I've got a lot to do to get the tank ready. I'm gonna be creating what's called a bioactive vivarium, which means it's a living system. There will be plants in there and insects in there that work together to help keep everything clean. And so this is gonna be, it's gonna be quite a challenge. Uh, we may have to do some fits and starts as things get corrected along the way. Um, Bearded dragons live in a very challenging environment in the wild. They are naturally from central Australia, which is extremely dry uh, and barren. Um, it is not a desert like when you think of, you think of the Sahara and you think of sand, but it is very dry and dusty and a compact clay soil. And uh, we're not gonna be creating that exactly, but we're gonna do the best we can to emulate that system, but also to allow for a living system of plants and animals in, plants and insects in there as well, that again, all work together to help create a, a living system, a bioactive system. All right, let's get started with the soil. The first step to layering my substrate is to put a thin layer of charcoal on the bottom of the tank. This will help to lift the soil off the bottom so that if I do water it too much, at least the soil won't soak it all up. On top of that, you need some kind of screen to keep the soil from working itself into the nooks and crannies of the charcoal. If that happened, it wouldn't be very effective. This layer isn't necessary in an arid landscape, but it's a good precaution against overwatering. Then we mix the soil, which is four parts organic soil, two parts play sand, two parts repti bark or orchid bark, two parts of excavator clay, two parts of coconut core, and one part of peat moss. Then mix it up thoroughly and add just enough water so it barely comes together. Don't add too much water, that's very important. Add the first layer of soil to the tank so that you don't knock the screen out of place. There should be excess screen all around so that it goes up the side of the tank, keeping the soil out of the charcoal. In my research, I found that the type of substrate to use is the most controversial topic among beardy keepers. Most keepers don't use a loose or soil substrate. They use tile, linoleum, repti carpet, or even paper towels, although some use just plain sand. The great fear of some keepers is impaction. Impaction occurs when an indigestible mass blocks the beardy's digestive tract. This can be very dangerous, even fatal. Because of this, lots of keepers will avoid any loose substrate at all. However, beardies naturally come from the arid outback of Australia. Their natural soil is heavy in clay, silt, sand, and rocks, as well as organic matter such as dried leaves, sticks, grass, and logs. Many zoos copy this kind of setup, and I want my beardy to have the most naturalistic environment I can provide to promote instinctual behaviors. In this soil mix, I have avoided unnatural elements such as perlite, vermiculite, and pet bedding such as wood shavings. I use a naturalistic substrate that includes fine organic material, sand, and clay. I don't believe it has any more risk than occurs in nature. There are three things to keep in mind to lessen the risk of impaction. One is to be sure and eliminate substrate particles that are not native to the habitat, like perlite and vermiculite. Two, be sure the diet you provide is appropriate. This includes fruits and vegetables, as well as insect feeders that are easy to digest. Crickets are common feeders that you can get at a pet store, but they have lots of indigestible material. The third thing is to be sure your beardy has adequate heat and light. Heat and light are actually critical to your beardy's digestive system. As I'm mixing this soil together, notice that the final product holds its shape when you dig in it. And that's similar to the natural habitat that a beardy comes from. So there we go, guys. The soil, uh, the substrate is in the tank. And uh, the next step is gonna be to add some hardscape to it. Bearded dragons love to climb and they love to bask. So in the heat and of course the special light, the UVB that they need. So I've got some rocks here that I have collected. Check this rock out. This one is real special. If you take a look real close, I'll zoom in here. You can see these fossils all in this rock that I, that I collected. Uh, based on the research that I've done, these fossils are approximately 400 million years old. And so just uh, 
a long, long, long time before the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs are closer to us than they are to the fossils in this rock by a long shot. Also collected some driftwood here and some eastern red cedar that had been uh, naturally hollowed out with time. And so I think that's going to make a great hide uh, for the bearded dragon if he chooses to use it. And uh, all of these have been, uh, the, the, the wood has been sterilized in an oven, baked in an oven at 350 degrees for a half hour. The, walks, the rocks, I just washed the rocks in water with a scrub brush. That should take care of any mites or fungus or anything like that would be, that would be on any of this. Part two here on this video is we're gonna set this up in the tank. Let's see how that goes. First and foremost, it's important to be sure the enclosure is safe. I'm stacking these rocks on the side of the tank where the basking lights will be. But these rocks are heavy, so I need to make them as stable as possible. I have to take my time to find the best fit and the most stability. I'm creating sort of an arch with the hiding area below the main rock, and I certainly wouldn't want the rocks collapsing on the little guy. So after I fiddle with the rocks to find a reasonably stable arrangement, I use an aquarium-safe silicone caulk as glue to bind it all together so it doesn't fall down. Once it dries, it will be stable and safe as well as provide a large basking area where he can soak up the sun. Next comes the driftwood I've collected. The limbs are from sycamore trees and the hollow log is from an eastern red cedar. The cedar is very weathered and old so there's no concern from tree sap and all the wood has been sterilized by baking in a 350 degree oven for at least 30 minutes. The point here is to create interesting and naturalistic features to climb on. The hollow log might be a place where he can brumate Brumation is a hibernation-like state that beardies engage in and can last from one to three months. There's a lot of variability in captive bred beardies regarding brumation, so we're just gonna have to wait and see how that plays out. We've already determined that a beardie's natural habitat is rocky, hard-packed scrubland. It's here that they frequently climb to bask in the blazing summer sun, perhaps hiding out under a rock in the middle of the day. On the hunt, they forage for insects around rocks, logs, and underbrush. The environment of the enclosure is important to consider. There needs to be a variety of zones. Some areas will be in the brightest light, others will be in the shade. Some will simulate the heat of an Australian summer sun while the other areas will be cooler. And some areas will be bone dry while other areas are more humid. Doing all this in one enclosure is the challenge, but it's a goal worth pursuing. The beardy will be healthier and happier as a result and that's my goal in creating this setup. Okay, the hardscape is in place. I got the rocks in place for the basking uh, spot. I've got some driftwood in there to climb on and hide in. Now the next stage is we've got to get some plants in this thing. One of the most important parts about creating this enclosure is you, you need to create zones. Zones that are from hot to cooler, zones that are drier to more humid. And that's very challenging in a single tank, but the plants are going to help me do that plus they all have to be edible because bearded dragons are omnivores and, and he will likely eat on some of these, munch from time to time. You just want to be sure that nothing is toxic inside your tank for your bearded dragon. So looking at my plants I've got here, and I've just bought these locally, but I have cleaned them uh, really well. I've rinsed them off. I've stripped away as much of the soil as I can easily enough without killing the plant. And also the perlite that is in the potting soil, I try to remove all that because that is not a very digestible item and can pose a hazard for your bearded dragon. But here I've got some uh, rosemary. You might be familiar with this in your herb garden. It smells nice. It's edible. It will, it will grow very vigorously uh, if he munches on it and happens to like the taste of it. So we've got some rosemary and it can handle drier conditions. Not the driest side of the tank, but together these plants are going to help me create a humid zone in one side of the tank. Plus, as an added bonus, they're going to help the insects that I add later because the insects will be able to live and harbor themselves uh, underneath and in the root area of the plants where it will be moisture. Okay, here we have some lavender. Lavender is an herb. This is a dwarf lavender, so it will not grow very big. And if it does grow too big, I can just cut it back. And I, I'm not bashful about replacing the plants. If I decide six months from now, a year from now that I don't like the plant, I can just pull it out and replace it with something else. But lavender is also edible and can handle drier conditions. So this will do well in the tank also. Here we have some aloe vera. You've probably seen this. Maybe some of you have this in your kitchen. You break off a stem and rub it on your burn if you have a, a burn in the kitchen. Um, this also can handle drier conditions and is edible. Very popular plant for bearded dragon enclosures. 
Here we have a jade plant, which is also edible, and uh, I just like the look of it. They can grow kind of big, um, but they're really, really slow growing. So I'm not too worried about that, and uh, hopefully that one will be okay as well. It adds a nice texture and density, I think, uh, to the enclosure. This is a plant that is related to what you might call hens and chicks. Um, it's an Echeveria, which is a, it's a hybrid of uh, different types of hens and chicks. And so it has a nice color pattern to it. Um, and so it's also can handle, this is probably the plant that can handle the driest conditions. So it will be closer to the basking side uh, of, the, uh, of the enclosure. All right, so let's go ahead and see how we're gonna set these up in the tank. When it comes to choosing plants for the enclosure, there are a couple things to keep in mind. First, all of the plants need to be edible. There are some easy choices here, and there are many websites to guide you, but pretty much any herb will work. Parsley, cilantro, rosemary, mint, thyme. These and many others will work well. Another type of plant is the succulents. These are desert type plants with thick fleshy leaves. But you should probably avoid cacti with sharp spines. Some of the most popular choices here are the ones I put in my own tank. Jade, hens and chicks, and aloe. Prickly pear is a good choice if you can find a variety without spines. Ideally, you will want to strip the plants of most of their old soil and give them a good washing. This prevents any issues with chemicals. Another plant solution is to sprout your own seeds in the tank. These can easily be refreshed and will give your beardy a tender plant to munch on. Lots of keepers are worried about humidity and so concerned about living plants. But based on what I've seen of outdoor keepers in Florida where humidity is sky high, humidity isn't the big concern lots of keepers think it is. What's really important is plenty of ventilation and a cage free of animal waste, fungus, and mold. You can still have plants and accomplish this. We're getting this tank almost finished and not a moment too soon. But I need to introduce you to the most important part of this mini ecosystem, and that's the cleanup crew. Let's take a look. Here we have two different animals that you can see, isopods and springtails. There are also lots of microorganisms in here that you can't see. Beneficial fungi, nematodes, bacteria, all of these will work together to keep the tank clean, at least hopefully. They'll eat the food scraps, skin sheds, and waste products and convert them into a form the plants can use. The beardy eats the plants and then the cycle starts anew. The big problem that remains is the humidity. Bearded dragons like a dry environment while the cleanup crew likes a damp one. This poses some challenges that I've addressed by creating little microclimates in the tank. With the wood, I will add some leaf litter later and hopefully that will keep the humidity at the soil level and not up in the air where the bearded dragon is. Now let's take a look in here. First, these isopods. You may know them as roly polies or pill bucks. There are thousands of species of isopods around the world on both the land and the water. Some of them are quite colorful and highly valued by collectors. For example, the rubber ducky isopods. Let me show you an example. Just look at that face. Aren't they cute? Isopods are a type of crustacean and are closely related to shrimp. They can also be a supplemental food source for the bearded dragon and prompt natural hunting behaviors as he rummages around and digs through the soil trying to find them. Springtails are another form of cleanup crew, but they're much smaller. You can hardly see them. There are also thousands of species around the world and they live on every single continent. They're one of the most numerous organisms in the world that you can see with the naked eye. They eat fungi and bacteria. The reason they're called springtails is because they have this appendage called a furcula that enables them to jump long distances. Now let's add these guys to the tank. Well, that's it as far as a cleanup crew. You just kind of dump them on top of the soil on the humid side of the tank. You'll add some leaf litter on top later to keep the humidity up for them and mist it every now and then. And of course, water the plants too. Also, you might need to have some extras on hand to replenish them from time to time. That's it, the tank is done, that wraps it up. I really appreciate you joining me in this journey. I have been an animal lover all my life and I've learned a lot in this process and I think there's kind of a lesson in there. You know, there's always something to be learning. So always be learning. That's an important life lesson, I think, not only for kids, but for adults as well. I'm sure I'm gonna be learning a lot more along the way. And uh, if you have any advice or guidance, you know, feel free to stop by and, and say hi. I certainly look forward to sharing what I learned. 
If you like this video, let me know down in the comments down below. You know, I've created a lot of different kinds of videos. Things about me as a person, things about the school, things about the students. What do you prefer? Let me know down in the comments down below. I'm curious. This weekend, I'm going to be going to Cincinnati to get the Bearded Dragon, and I hope you will check back for the future video for the full reveal and uh, finalize the name on this little guy. I would sure very much appreciate it if you could hit that subscribe button, like this video, and just maybe, just maybe, share it on your social media. I'm Richard Royster, Associate Principal of Lafayette High School. You know, that's a good thing to remember. Always be learning. I like that. I'm going to use that more often. Always be learning, guys. I'll see you in the next one.